second here. All right, welcome everybody. Hello there, I'm Ryan here at the Mysterious Bookshop and we are so thrilled to welcome Sarah Gran and Ed Brubaker. We are of course talking about the book of the most precious substance here. Signed copies are available at the Mysterious Bookshop. So if uh, you've been interested, if this talk interests you, we have plenty of copies for sale. So uh, please order them. Uh, Sarah and Ed, both, thank you both so much for being here. Sarah, we're so happy that uh, we get to partner with you and celebrate uh, your new uh, publishing company in this new thank book. Thank you. Everything. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you two. Enjoy. I should be back in about 45 minutes or so, but uh, have a great chat and uh, enjoy yourselves. Thank you, Ryan. And I said, I just said this when we were off air, but I will say it on air too. I cannot believe how kind you and Otto and everyone at the Mysterious Bookshop has been, not just with this book, but with all of my books. You guys have just uh, been such good friends to me and I could not be more grateful. So thank of course. you. We're, we're big fans and you're always such a pleasure. Yeah. So, uh, and too, by the way. <laughs> Ed, Ed hasn't been such a bad friend either. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy, you guys. Have a good one. Thank you, Ryan. You've been a pretty good friend too, Ed. Thank you for yeah. doing this with me. Thank you. Of course. No, oh, I'm honored. Um, so I guess I just want to ask you a few questions. Well, we'll get into the you starting your own publishing company to publish this book later. But the first thing that I wanted to talk about was just uh, where, I mean, you. I, I know your work so well, and I always think I know where you're going. Like, you know, with a story and you always go a bunch of different directions while it's still sort of going where I thought you were going. <laughs> but for this one, like, I, I feel like, did it start out as a mystery novel and then you suddenly realized it was going to be an erotic thriller or did you actually just, did it come to you in one like lightning bolt of like, hey, I should make like, you know, a kind of a thriller, but that's actually about fucking. Yeah. <laughs> Thank like, you for how did that, like what was your creative process there? Because I always um, I always start with like one one thing that will spring the the rest of the book around it. So I always start with a couple different things. I always start I had wanted to do something in the rare book world for a long time. And then more and more I had wanted to do something that was in that universe of like the ninth gate. We have talked about that movie. Oh, yeah. You know I am obsessed with that. The Da Vinci Code, I've been the to books. Sintra multiple times, just partly, you know, I walk by the streets where they filmed part of that in there. Oh, cool. Um, book collector. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, that woman in the wheelchair eating the yeah. orange, that's the best Cre Yeah, creepy, creepy book people are, yeah, the, yeah. yeah. I thought I wanted, about that. Club du Ma is the the book it's based on. I think I have not read the book. I am, the am book embarrassed is totally to say different than the movie. Yeah, but, that's but, what I've heard, and I have that. such an affection for that movie. And it's yeah. the same with the Dan Brown books. I find the books, you know, I hate to knock another writer, but I find them unreadable. But I found that I enjoy the movies, and I wanted to do something that was like enjoyable, like that would be a good book, a meaningful book, a book that has the same sort of weight as I as I hope my other work has, but that you could just sit down and read and be really engrossed in. And, you know, I was going through a hard time. My parents were ill and I wanted to just read something that I could just lose myself in for a day. Um, it's like an airport book, but a sort of better version of that. Yeah. And I couldn't really find one. So I wrote one. Um, and then the sex part of it came in as I was going. Um, and I was like, oh, this this is what this needs to be. This is where this needs to go. It's something I've never done before. So that will be a huge challenge to me. And I enjoy huge challenges. I don't want to do something so, else. It's a huge challenge. So were you actually like writing the initial chapters without knowing necessarily what the book was going to be about? Or yeah, you... I always do that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's yeah. Really fascinating. You, so you always know what you're going to do. But that's not true because we've, we've had conversations when yeah. you're almost done with a book and like. Where, yeah, where I'm like walking you through the book up to this point where I'm stuck at something. Yeah, yeah, I usually know where I plan to go, but I don't always follow the plan because, you know, the characters sort of, the, the cliche of the characters take over, but they do. And also sometimes you're like, oh, I only have 10 pages left. How do I wrap this up? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can do as many pages that's, as I want. Yeah, that's yeah. different. I, I, that's you can do not as a many problem pages. I will ever have. Yeah. 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 Um, but so that's really fascinating because uh, so it started from the rare book world because I obviously you and I have both worked in bookstores. 
I, I last worked in a bookstore on Castro Street in the 90s, back in the mm. early days of the internet, where, and we had like a whole back room of like rare books that were just sold through the internet and stuff. So I dealt with a lot of those same kind of weird book characters, but also yeah. like all the weird little speed freaks that would come in trying to sell you like books they pulled out of the trash. Oh yeah, um, I used to work at the Strand where they would just oh. I don't they don't do it anymore, but they would outright buy stolen books, you know, at oh, one yeah. point in time in the 90s. They would just outright like obviously fell off a back of a truck books. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they do not do that anymore from what I've heard. Um and then I worked at Housing Works. I worked at a bunch of new bookstores too, but that's not as much fun or or as relevant to the topic. And then when I worked at Housing Works bookstore in New York City, uh, Nancy Cooper, a dear friend, ran the rare books operation there. And I just wanted to work with her because it oh, was wow. more fun than working on the floor and because she kind of knew everything about rare books. And, and often people who are like experts in an area, like will just dole out information. And she wasn't like that. She's like, no, no, no. I want to teach you everything I know. Yeah. Um, so I ended up kind of being the rare books assistant there. And I also did all the merchandising and displays, which is something I did when I worked at new bookstores as well. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you've um, actually spent a lot of time in the rare book area, which my- A little bit, a little our bit. Our boss wouldn't let us touch the rare books. Yeah, I, I <laughs> had to prove myself. To, uh, he would show them to us as he was preparing to box them up, like how whatever he had done to them to make them look a little bit more perfect. Yeah, um, and, a, and a lot of that is super shady, which I also wanted to get into in the book. There's a lot of switching desk jackets oh, and, yeah. and stuff like that, which- um, you yeah, know, rebinding I, I, books, yeah. like taking the, taking the hardback off of another book and putting it on a new on a book that had a yeah. Up on. Yeah, I, seeing all that stuff in action. There, they in that TV show you that's about the weird. Stuff, oh yeah, right? there's a lot of like, there's a lot of stuff about, about how he puts together like fake first editions and stuff. Where I was like, yeah. oh wow, that's all pretty accurate. I think. Yeah, <laughs> and I always feel like if you collect first editions, you know maybe you deserve it because that's the the least interesting area of book collecting to me i mean i think you're in the same boat there's like, i have a couple of first editions of things that i love but they're not in mint condition or not expensive because i'm cheap yeah but to me I, book collecting is more about like what's that weird fucking thing you saw in a thrift shop that if you don't buy it today you will never see it again yeah yeah that's true well that's what i love about this book is so the the rarefied air of a book that that rare and that expensive that like if you start hunting for it all the other people in the world who are interested in it or could afford the book start sort of coming out of the woodwork it's got a real creepy kind of rosemary's baby kind of feel to it in that way where it's it's like Good. with each step she takes on her journey you're sort of like more at least me i was like oh where's the what's the what's gonna happen with this one and then i'm and then i'm like well i assume some fucking but <laughs> <laughs> but it but didn't also, always happen yeah exactly no some of it went in directions i wasn't expecting at all like most of the most of the last half of the book i was just like holy shit oh holy shit oh good um, that's yeah. really good cool that's yeah. nice to hear and um but so did you as you wrote it when you were going on did you did you think of it as a mystery novel while you were writing it too? Or do you even think about that? I don't really think about that. I knew once I really got into it, I knew I wanted to be this very straight shot structure, which I'm calling a thriller. It's been interesting to see it categorized differently everywhere as all the PR stuff, which has been wonderful, has been gearing up over the past few weeks, but it's been in some horror stuff. I mean, all of this is good. I've, I have no complaints about any of it. It's just interesting that some people have categorized it as horror because they know me more from Come Closer, my horror book I wrote 20 oh, years yeah. ago. Some people have categorized it as a mystery based on my detective novels. I'm calling it a thriller. Um, but I, you know, everyone can call it whatever they want. I'm not attached to that. But like, I had wanted this, you know, my Claire DeWitt books, the detective series I write, those books have gotten so big and so complicated. Yeah. And I've created such a drastically huge world that I've really fucked myself because now they're really hard to write. So with <laughs> this, I just want it to be like this clean shot. She's looking for the book. She either finds the book or she doesn't. That's it. That's the story. Yeah. It's but very, it's very so straightforward. Feels, I mean, well, everything you write, even, I mean, there's the argument of whether noir and detective novels are the same thing or are they are different, which... If they're not, then Raymond Chandler never wrote a noir. So they, I um, think they overlap. They overlap. Yeah, they overlap. Because this to me, like the character feels like a noir hero to me. I heard and, that from a couple people. Yeah, and her journey me. throughout the story really feels like like to the point where where 
like a noir story always has an, an inevitability to it. And, and yeah. I know as I was reading more and more, I started to be like, oh God. And then, and, and sort of like rooting for her, but also being like, oh, wait a second. Oh shit. Oh, hold on. Like, which is how you feel when you're reading a good noir is you're kind of like rooting for the person that you know may fail or or may die or may already be dead and narrating the story from beyond yeah. the grave. For all well, you, you know that, you know, I know you know the James Elroy definition of noir, right? You're fucked. That's the definition. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. I, that seems like something you would know. Um, That's hilarious. But yeah, yeah it's funny. I heard that from a couple of people and I didn't quite get it. But now that you articulate it. Yeah. I mean, as you know, I'm a huge film noir fan and a huge yeah. Uh, book noir fan and um and i think that just uh, comes through in everything that i do so even though that was definitely not intentional when i wrote this that's not what i was thinking of yeah, i think it it's just ingrained me. in me at this point yeah it surprised me as it went on even though you drop hints early on that it's definitely a bit of a crime story and a bit of a it's so many it's so many different genres all sort of smashed together but as I started to realize the underpinning noir of, of it, I was just like, oh, man, this is amazing. Like, who would have thought, you know, like, uh, to me, I just I just was kind of blown away by it. So we have a question on the side that I want to oh, ask you. I can't see it. Let me try moving Sarah, the comments. Oh, now I see. From Katie. Oh, hi, Ken. I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name. Uh Sarah, I love this book so much. I read an arc with right to left directionality. Does that follow through in the printed book? If so, is that a nod to ancient grime wars in our printed and read? No, you know, it's funny because I got an email, Katie. I don't know if that was from you or from someone else asking about that. And I don't know what that means. I think maybe you got a defective arc. Sorry. <laughs> mine, I apologize. Mine did in not have that. <laughs> no, it might this hopefully it just reads for everyone like a normal book. Although perhaps if I was smart, I would have done a, a Katie's version because that sounds really cool. But no, I think I got you a defective book, Katie. And if you hit me up, I will send you a book that uh, is functional. <laughs> Hold it up to a mirror to read. Yeah, um, yeah that's weird. Um, she said it was a beautiful arc and easy to read. <laughs> Good. Oh, okay. So you are the person I got the email from, I think, because you had mentioned the type size, because I did make the type size intentionally a little bit bigger than is common in books now, because um, so many books now... You know, paper is very expensive. So type in novels keeps getting smaller and smaller. And I am 50 and I am sort of borderline on reading glasses. They're not comfortable oh, yeah. to me. Everybody with. So I worked with a designer. I was like, I want this to be in a font that I can read without my glasses. So it's not like a large print book, but people who are really into books will notice it's not 10 or 11 point. I don't remember. It's 12 point, I think. It's, yeah. but you know, that is obviously dependent on what font you use and whatnot, but it is a tiny bit bigger than is common in a, yeah, I have bifocals and then I also have computer glasses now so that I don't do that tilt thing when I'm sitting at the computer where you're trying to look through the bifocals part. <laughs> yeah, I did what you did and got the glasses just for the computer. And, yeah. um, and then the problem is I keep forgetting I have them on and turn away. Oh, yeah. And, and then I give myself a splitting headache. So those No, I'm like halfway somewhere and I realize I'm wearing these instead of my real glasses when I'm in the car. I'm like, no. Yeah, <laughs> I, I just made my type bigger. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so, um, well, I'm trying to figure out what else I need to ask you about the book. So how much, how much research did you do in... Are the various characters that come out of the woodwork about the book, are they are they based on real people that you met in the rare book world at all? Or are they just sort of people that you've drawn from, you know, aspects of different people that you've known? Because they all felt very like I like I met people like that in that world. Um, Hold on one second. Sorry. Can you? My doorbell's ringing. Sorry about that. But my friend is here to help, luckily. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I wish I knew people like that. Yeah, especially the sex witches. No, sadly, no one was based on a real person. It's all fictional. Uh, um, the people like when you first meet in the book before she gets into the yeah. fancy yeah, the Ninth book Gate sort of universe, those are very much based on people who I've encountered in my life, for sure. Yeah, um, the book cares felt really real to me. I was To the point, yeah. when you started the sections where she's going through the like thrift shops and finding books and knowing how much she could sell it for like that just felt so like 
like that there was a part of your life where you actually did that? I did. There was a part of my life where I did that. Absolutely. And it's still like a habit of like, if I go to thrift shops, I look and see, you know, not just to read. And then if I see a good book, I'm, I'm just happy to leave it behind for a book dealer. Yeah. Um, but I do sort of play like, oh, is this a first edition? Is this, you know, what I think it is? It's still just a fun, silly hobby. Yeah. So let's talk about the sex magic then. Okay. Let's talk about it. <laughs> How... What is that based on? Is there is there stuff is there research you did into various ancient sex magic y stuff or was it all just completely drawn out of your head? Uh the actual technique in the book of that system of magic is all drawn out of my head, but it yeah, is very much inspired by real things. Um, you know, Alistair Crowley and um Beverly Pascal and uh you know, there, there are a bunch of people who have really sort of pioneered this stuff. There's a woman named Kat Ironwood who runs an occult shop in Forestville, California. Do you know who she is? Yeah. She is one of the kind of authorities on sex magic. So if anyone wants to know more, they should Google her. I think her last name is Y-R-O-N. Yeah, she's a big comic book. Uh, yeah, she's a comic book person too. She yeah, used to yeah. Be, she used to be so, the, a publisher or editor in comics. Um. um and now she has this beautiful occult shop called Lucky Mojo, but she has also done extensive writing on sex magic. And if anyone wants to know more, she is, oh, I got flowers here. Let's show them to the, uh... good. Someone sent me flowers. Don't know who. Aww. I broke my ankle for those of you who don't know. So I'm getting a lot of gift packages <laughs> in the house. A lot, a lot of good Jewish food is coming to the house. So a lot of cats's and um, <laughs> uh, Zabar's and Russ and Daughters is coming and flowers too now. Yeah. Do you have like pins in your ankle now? I do. They put actual hardware in my ankle, which thankfully I cannot feel it. Oh man! Uh, but I can feel where they did the surgery. I had surgery is it on Friday. permanent hardware, or does it? Yeah, come yeah. Oh, wow. so I am no longer fully human. So you're Very a proud part cyborg now. I next, am. Next book. Next book is cyborg book. <laughs> I kept asking them, "What's it made out of?" I wanted to know all the details, and they were very vague. But I think it's it's platinum or stainless or titanium. Titanium, or probably. Titanium, yeah. yeah, something that will not cause an infection inside you. Ideally, <laughs> we hope. We hope. <laughs> um, yes, but the so, sex magic stuff is based on. I have always been interested in occult stuff, and uh, sex magic is a big part of that. And uh, yeah, and and Catherine Ironwood is definitely the great place to. Yeah, to, I always think of you as one of my occult-oriented friends. Thank you. <laughs> like, when I saw Crowley being mentioned, I'm like, oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, you know me well enough to know to know. My well, friend you had kind of told me what the book was about at first, anyway. Yeah, um, we must have talked about it quite a bit over the past couple of years. So, so the book isn't real, unfortunately. Sadly, well, fortunately. Yeah, yeah. Because you have. Well, I don't want to ruin. The, God, I'm about to ruin your book for everybody. I know. Shut up, um, man. All right. So instead of me ruining your book for everybody, <laughs> so. Why did you decide with this book? So I assume you just wrote the book like without any idea of what, how you were going to publish it or anything, just like every other book you start. Um, yeah. But when you were done with this one, you decided to start your own publishing company and, and do it that way. Why did you, why'd you go that route? Um, I have age? always wanted to start my own publishing company ever since I published my first book. And I'm glad I didn't do it from the very start because I've built up an audience over the years that I don't think I could have done alone. Like I've had a lot of good stuff from working with other publishers, but I've also had some bad stuff. And you have heard me complain a lot over the years. I will be more polite now that we were in a public forum. <laughs> <laughs> you will be I've like, I, I know for a fact. Word. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. No, 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 never, never. Um, you know, I've had really good experiences and really bad experiences, but, you know, uh, I love books. This is something I had always wanted to do. So there was just the big carrot, you know, there's a carrot and a stick. And the carrot was that I had always wanted to do this. It had always been my dream to learn more about the publishing process, to make my own decisions. Also, I am a cranky, bitchy 50 year old woman, and I didn't want to collaborate on every little fucking detail of the book. Uh, <laughs> You know, my last couple books, like you get into it with people and about the jacket copy, about the cover, about oh, yeah. everything becomes like there's no science to it. So it would be great if the publisher actually knew. And it's not that they don't know because they're bad people are bad at their job. No one knows. You can say, oh, we've done this before and it didn't sell. But when you look at what does sell, there is no formula behind it. If there was, yeah. that's all they do. But obviously yeah. they don't know. Every, which book is fine. Would, every book cover would look like To Kill a Mockingbird. 
Yeah, yeah. Or, or um, in cold blood or something. Yeah, um, yeah. But those yeah. books didn't work because of their covers. They worked because yeah. of other reasons. And um, and sometimes the cover is really helpful and sometimes the cover doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, uh, but I didn't want to spend the rest of my life arguing with people about jacket copy and cover designs and, and stuff like that. And and I'm cranky and I'm independent. And um, yeah. it, it probably says more about me than about the publishing industry that I just kind of wanted to do it all myself. And I also knew that this book had the potential to sell in a different way than my other books had sold. Uh, yeah. I It's sold very well today. It's been a really good first day. Um, it's been kind of wonderful. And who knows if that'll keep up. You know, if we keep selling like this every day, it'll be a fucking great selling book. But either way, it's already selling pretty decently. And um, what was my point? My point was that this was a good book to start my own press with because I knew it could sell. I knew like even if I didn't capture a larger literary market, there is a, a targeted Amazon Kindle market for yeah. people who want to read fiction with some erotica in it and a thriller component. Oh, yeah. I knew it had a sort of sales potential that my other books did not have. And I was like, I'm going to fucking kill myself. I will never forgive myself if I hand this over to Simon's House of Random Penguins, as I call them. Yeah. The one publisher left standing. It is giant. It is. I mean, I don't know if you've been there. It is a large igloo type place in Midtown Manhattan. There are random penguins in there. And they just walk <laughs> around until they bump into each other. And they're like, I'm Simon. Are you Simon? <laughs> um, so that's what goes on there from what I've heard. <laughs> and uh, I was like, I'm going to fucking kick myself if I give this to them and they just let it fall through the cracks, which does happen uh, even with great people on your team and even with the best of intentions. Sometimes you sell a book and then they buy other books that they are a lot more excited about. Yeah. Um, and it's been really great. Like I have fucked up a lot. <laughs> I have made a lot of mistakes, um, but I don't really mind. I, I prefer to make my own mistakes. I find it very frustrating if I'm on a team and other people fuck up. Oh, yeah. Um, and not in a judgmental way. I just would rather fuck up myself and then yeah, just, yeah. Be, just deal with it rather than have to have a big committee decision about dealing yeah, with I'm it. Yeah, I'm a total control freak to the point yeah. where it's like, I if I'm going to be mad at somebody about something, I want it to be mad at me for making a mistake, not someone yeah. else for making a mistake that ruined my print run or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you learn something from your own mistakes. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I work with the publisher, but we turn our stuff in basically print ready. Uh, well, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about how image works? Cause I think that's really interesting to people and it's so They're, different than most. And I'm still very confused by the whole model. Well, um, they, they were started 30 years ago by I think the six or eight biggest uh, artists in comics. It started out as an art run as an artist run company. And they figured out that the actual publishing side of publishing could be done in a very small way with a limited number of people. If everybody just prepared their books, the actual amount of people it took in production to get a book from, you know, being drawn and lettered and colored to sent to the printer, to send to a distributor. Like they worked with this, with another publisher at first to see how it was done. And then they were like, Oh, we can do this with like eight people. Um, and, you know, and they set up a system where, basically all the money goes to the creators uh, except for like minimal fees that the publishing company takes to sort of do the, the work that the, that you can't do of, you know, but nowadays with self publishing, you know, uh, a lot of like Amazon, I think is even set up for people now to just self publish through Amazon even. Yeah. But, uh, but, but with but image, what you have with images distribution. Yeah. Image, we have like distribution deals and they have, you know, reps that talk to the bookstore people and comic store people. So it's like, we're, they're about 50 50 sales through bookstores and sales through comic book stores, which is a whole other crazy market, which, you know, has thrived during the pandemic somehow. Which oh, has comic been book amazing. stores have? Oh, yeah. Comic book stores are having their best years ever, as far as I can tell. Oh, that's um, fantastic. I didn't yeah, know. Yeah. And it's, I think part of it was because the pandemic freaked so many of us out about like the things that we loved that we didn't want to go away. You know, like, oh, I don't want bookstores to go away. I don't want comic book stores to go away. I don't want movie theaters to go away, but I don't want yeah. to go away. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do go to bookstores. Uh, so. but, but there was definitely, um, you know, a, a thing in comics, I think, where people just, you know, started ordering stuff from their stores to do to switch to mail order and stuff. A lot of stores were already in the process of having like online accounts for their customers. So 
yeah, they've seen a real uptick the last few years, bizarrely. Um, and, well, independent bookstores, too. I don't know about the pandemic in particular, but they've been doing better and better over the past few years after the big decimation in the early 2000s. Yeah. They've yeah, been the, doing better and better. The past. And, and independent bookstores do a much better job than they used to do. You know, a lot of the ones that closed in the early 2000s, you would sort of walk in and get sneered at, like the old record stores. And of course, <laughs> there's something beautiful about that. All of all of us older folk uh, remember that yeah. fondly of, of either being the sneering person or getting sneered at. But it's not actually great for sales. Yeah. <laughs> and that does not happen anymore. It's not actually great for sales to have the, not. the Jack Black at the register. Yeah, yeah. As fun yeah. as it is to be that person, it's it's not good for for spending. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was that guy at the at the bookstore. I would just be sitting at the front counter reading a mystery book and laughing. <laughs> it was like an asshole. That was fun <laughs> time, you know. Um, you are forgiven. <laughs> I'm for uh, yeah. I, it was a time where you were allowed to do stuff like that. There was no internet. <laughs> no one could film you. No one. No, no one could one, catch you being an asshole. Yeah, there were no the cell book. phones. <laughs> <laughs> People had Here's no Ed choice. Baker being a dick to me when I was 25. Um, <laughs> I'm sure someone's got that on tape somewhere. Oh my God. Yeah. Um, so how have you, so you said you've made some mistakes, but overall, like you're, you're loving publishing your own book. Yeah, I really am. I really am. I'm going to give it about like six weeks to see how things pan out and then decide if I'm ready to, cause I do want to publish other authors as well. Yeah. So, uh, I did print on demand for this book, which is tricky it's not ideal because it takes a while to ship and the copies okay. are they're not terrible quality but they are not quite as nice as a regular offset printer because it's digital printing but i probably would have had to do digital printing either way and with all of the uh supply chain issues there's no way i would have gotten space at a printer i just would not have done it yeah the big um, yeah that's the thing like with image they publish a lot of stuff so i can always get my books printed but we're we're like buying paper a year ahead of time now you yeah, know, to, to um, make sure everything's in stock. It's it's insane with the wow. Yeah, so um, I might keep on print on demand for my next few books until things settle down with this supply chain stuff. So, uh, well, there's yeah. also you can work out uh, like distribution deals with other publishers and stuff so that you can help like print your books at their yes. prices and things like that. That's the next thing to really figure out is distribution. Because I did my print on demand through Ingram, which is the biggest book distributor. So they're doing oh, it for now. But like I said, yeah. print on demand is not perfect. There are yeah. problems with it. And in this particular moment in time, there are lesser problems than I would have had going with traditional printing and publishing for sure. But yeah. in the long term, I do want that higher print quality and that better distribution system in place. I now is not really the time to. Yeah. that. <laughs> but over the next couple of years. Sometimes I order a book online and I don't realize until I it gets to me until I've actually got to the last page of the book where I'm like oh this was printed on demand like it's like the, the yeah. quality has jumped a lot in the last like 10 years for, it really has yeah and you know. the quality of books from mainstream publishers has gone down and the quality of print on demand has gone up yeah it's a it's an interesting industry I mean nobody I'm sure there's lots of people who get into publishing to make money but nobody who really sticks with being a book person and writing books and publishing books does it for anything other than love. Yeah. You know? Like I thought that was interesting in your book, actually just the, like, even though, well, we can say your main character, it says on the back of the book, she's a, she's a, a an ex writer who has become a book dealer, but her love of books is so clear throughout the whole thing. And I know I've gone book shopping with you at used bookstores. We have, yeah. Like, and, and like, I look for weird old pulp covers and you look for weird, weird books. <laughs> <laughs> accurate, accurate. And weird old pulp covers. And yeah. you know, I still collect map backs. Yes. Yeah, the map backs are your thing. Yeah, every time I find a map back, I set it aside for you. Oh, thank you. Um, but uh, but yeah, the love of books really comes through. And I thought that was interesting uh, in it because it speaks to, it reminded me as I was reading it, it, it reminded me and made me want to go back and read again. I'm sure you've never read them. The the Bookman series by John Dunning. I have read them. Oh, you have? Okay. Yeah, those are really fun. Those yeah, my are really dad fun. used to go to his rare bookstore, actually. Oh, cool. <laughs> Whenever he was in Denver. Oh, I've never been to Denver. I had wanted to go, but he's gone now. He has probably yeah. passed away a couple of years ago. So sadly, that series is over. But, yeah. That is a great rare book series. And it's... um. 
Yeah, I remember uh, a fun one paperback of them, mystery series. Yeah, I remember one of them being about like a, a rare edition of a book that was being forged. And, you know, it was like you would learn so much about books and collecting and how much things were worth. Uh, like I know I was, I was working at a bookstore while I was reading those books and people would occasionally. I probably was in, too. Yeah, people would occasionally bring in uh, like all these books and they're like, these are all first edition. And I would have picked them up and immediately I'm like, no, this is a book club edition. It is, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. watching people's faces fall when they realize that they're, they're, they're like first edition of Catch the Hobbit. The right. yep. worth $10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought that was, I thought that was really great. So, um, uh, okay. I see a question from my friend Mickey there. here. Yeah. That's my oh. friend Mickey Halpern. Hi Mickey. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so my friend Ken Foster weighed in and said it's great being a cyborg. He would know because he has a, uh, a pacemaker in his heart. So all of, all of my only semi-human friends are chiming in. And oh, Mickey, yeah. you might have some hardware in your ankle too. I remember you also had ankle surgery. So my, so my whole Mick, team of, of semi-human people is here. Mickey says, I was wondering if Sarah could speak about how visual her books are and wonder if she has any <laughs> visual or image-based part of her writing practice. Um, that's just how my brain works, actually. It's funny because when people say that to me, I'm always like, huh, I don't do it on purpose. But I tend to see my books as pictures in my head rather than as words first. So, uh, and Ken says, cyborgs unite. Yes, thank you, Ken. We are all now cyborgs. <laughs> um, uh, I tend to see my books as pictures in my head first instead of written words, which I think is, you know, this thing has come out on the internet. One of the cool things about the internet is people comparing experiences that some people don't have a mind's eye. Have you heard about this? No. It's this thing that people realize sort of talking to people on Twitter and Reddit. And now it's like a recognized neurological thing that some people can't make a visual picture in their eye. Oh, so whatever crazy. that is, I have like the polar opposite that my brain is filled with extremely detailed bright visual images um and i don't dream often but when i do it's very vivid and visual are um, those people who don't have that are they able to like read and enjoy books or do they have to actually see movies to visualize that stuff i think they enjoy books for other reasons okay there's other things to enjoy but when i read a book i like to really paint that picture in my head and i don't do it intentionally it's just kind of what my brain does so that part of my brain is just a bit overactive i think yeah i remember i, can't, I think it was either paul oster or, or john irving was talking about they put enough just enough description into the places they're describing they're thinking of specific places from their lives that they're describing but they never overload the detail enough that so everybody can sort of imagine what their grandmother's attic felt like when they when they climbed into it as a kid. Yeah, I, I try to do that with people like with places. I like to get pretty specific. Um, thank you, Mark. Nice comment from Mark Goldfinger, who is a longtime correspondent here. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, I do that when I describe people. I really like to just because uh, uh, words mean different things to different people. So if you say someone's tall, what does that mean? That means something different to different people. So that I try to make a little bit more impressionistic so the person can sort of fill in those holes themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I never get a complete... Yeah, that's interesting. I always... Well, I always imagine the main character looking like you ever since I met you. Well, that's a weird thing of reading <laughs> books by your friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's where it gets weird, yeah. Life which is funny. which is like I know you're not Claire DeWitt and you're yeah. not Lily and <laughs> but you know I mean I also know that everybody in every book is a part of the is, is somehow a part of your imagination or your own I life think so. I think so uh, when you write everything you write is some part of yourself yeah what is your next book about books going to be now because I was thinking of detection or how are you pronounce that book? Good enough for me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my French is not good. Yeah, that is for my detective series that I write. Oh, Erica's, wait, Erica just said not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not yet what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so do you have, do you know what your next book is going to be already? Or are you in the form formative stages? Or are you too caught up in the publishing to get right back into the grind? Um, I'm always working on a bunch of stuff, you know, with the exception of the past few weeks since I broke my ankle and have been uh, largely on drugs. This has been the longest I've gone without writing in years, maybe my whole adult life. Oh, wow. um, yeah, because I'm just not clear headed enough. I have like two good hours a day and I save it for things like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But yeah, I am at work on the next Claire DeWitt novel, and I want to do a book of Claire DeWitt short stories, which I will probably oh, wow. release pretty soon because I have a bunch of short stories that I either went to my private newsletter that I used to have. I now have a public one on Substack, and um, some of them were published in England and Germany, but almost none of them, or maybe actually none of them were published here. In the oh, United. yeah. Well, I love that, the, uh, the Choose Your Own Adventure one that you wrote. That's I love that too. Yeah, that's one of my favorite things I've ever written. So what I'm trying to do now is do a story in like a fortune teller, those paper fortune tellers. Oh my God. Yeah, no luck so far. <laughs> I've been trying for like six the, months to make it work. Mm -hmm, the thing, mm -hmm. Oh my God. That'd yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. I, in the middle of the book. You have to yeah, I'm trying. I'm right trying. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, you know, you got to come up with ways to challenge yourself and to make things interesting. So I wrote this choose your own adventure story, which I was referring to. I want to write a whole book in choose your own adventure format. I really want to do that. Um, and it's just requires some math and some planning and some figuring it out. Well, what I found with that short story you wrote was that after I did the choose the choosing part, I went back and read the entire thing anyway. I read every choice, which is what I think I did with the choose your own yeah, adventure. Yeah, I would too. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so yeah, you read the whole thing anyway. You do the first one as the. Uh, yeah, this is what I would do. And you're like, oh, I died. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, then, and there's one I, famous choose your own adventure book where there's a chapter you cannot get to unless you just read it. Yeah, unless you're a cheater. Yeah, you can't get yeah. the good ending unless you cheat. Yeah, I remember that one because I cheated. I think I have I it. Like, yeah, I have a bunch no way of to now. turn to that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm they were kind of metaphysical. With, I, I'm obsessed with those ones too. I always think about those in life, like all the the choices you didn't make and what could have. I, I feel like that's like, you know, one of the one of the ways noir stories start is is like you hit a point where you're looking at your real life and you're thinking, what if this or what if that instead? Oh yeah. What if I definitely. made this decision today instead of the other one? You know. Well, I feel like a lot of my writing is looking back at my past and being like, what if I had made the bad decision at that moment instead of the good decision? <laughs> like, what if I had not stayed out more instead of gone home or, or gone with that guy instead of the one I went with? Or you Yeah. Know? So are you going to re-release all the Claire DeWitt books through your own label then? Or? They're still in print. They're all still oh, okay. in print. All my previous books are still in print except Jope, but the publisher will not give me the rights back. They keep saying it's in print. It's sort of semi in print. You can get it on Amazon, but bookstores can't order it. I've gone through a million rounds of arguments with them about it. And uh, there's nothing to do short of taking them to court, which, of course, I'm not going to do. Yeah. Um, spend their life in court. Yeah. 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 It's not worth it because you can get the book. You just can't get it consistently. So it's not like it's completely unavailable. So my first two books are still in print from Soho Press. Dope is kind of in and out of print from Berkeley, Putnam, Penguin House, whatever. Then the first two books... Uh, the Claire DeWitt books are with Houghton Mifflin. They're still in print. And then the last one from Simon and Schuster, Atria. Okay, but you're able to take, you're able to take Claire DeWitt and, and do new books for your, for your yeah, I have all the rights to the character oh, okay. and everything, but uh, the old book. So as long as they keep them in print, I'm really happy, you know, oh, okay. um, and if well, they drop good. them, I will definitely reprint them myself. And that was another yeah. reason I did start my own press is because I don't ever want to end up in another situation. Like I've been in with, dope and, and a couple other things going in and out of print and having that become complicated like i don't care if the book sells it might not be important to anyone else but it's important to me yeah i yeah i i know you and and like charlie and several other like i mean ha half my friends are crime novelists and i've always coming out of comics i've always been surprised to hear how little input they would they would have into like the way their books looked or the f type fonts even and stuff like I was always surprised any any author friends I have, have yeah. myriad complaints about their book covers unless they have that like million selling book and then they don't care what happened on their book cover. Yeah. And then also you get the you get like, the Da Vinci Code did look great. Yeah. <laughs> and also if you sell a million copies, you will hopefully get a bigger say in the conversation. But I wouldn't know because I've never sold a million copies. Yeah, no, me either. Not um, yet. Not, Not yet. yet. Yeah, this we're, is we're, getting the we're getting there. We're getting there. Ryan is working on it for me. Yes, I'm doing my best. The yeah. most precious substance, Matt. We've if you've done all the rituals in the book this time, right? So. Is that me? Yeah. yeah. Well, not not all of them. Not quite all of them. All, all the fun ones, not the all last the one. Yeah. <laughs> um, do are there any? Someone just wrote tarot cards? Question mark. 
I used to be a big tarot card reader and I would love to do like a story in tarot cards or print my own deck. For years, I had this dream of publishing my own tarot deck. And I'm also really into these like art card decks that a lot of artists have done, like Kiki Smith and I think Sophie Call might have one. I have Elise, uh, uh, Edward Gorey, you know, the Fantod pack. I would love to do something like that. I draw, even though I'm terrible at drawing, but I would want to get a real artist or, or I do photography too. Again, I'm terrible at it, but I really enjoy it. So doing my own tarot card deck uh, is a dream come true. Thank I could you. See you doing a tarot card reading for a character and then and then writing a story about. I have. That. You've done that. Wow. Yeah, not around it, but like as I've been going, I've like done astrology or pulled tarot cards oh, wow. or stuff to kind of figure out what I was doing. Yeah. It's like Philip K. Dick using the I Ching to write a book, and then every time yeah. the characters threw the through the sticks, he actually did it, and that was what. They oh, threw. cool. Yeah, they're no, doing, he was mad oh. later than like the ending of the book. <laughs> I love that. That is so cool. That's a cool way to think about doing a choose your own adventure is to do a reading instead of a page this, page that. Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah. Here we are DJ, doing DJ just... Glitton, we're just stealing your idea here and we're running with <laughs> yeah. it. And then the next time you see me and Ed Reed, like, we're gonna be like <laughs> we have this great idea, which we came up with all by ourselves. We don't even know anyone named DJ Glitton. We are clever writers who come up with clever stuff. We don't know this that is, guy. This is basically Sorry, DJ. like you and I talking normally, except now we're uh, we're withholding details. Yeah, that's what I figured this would be. Yeah, we have these conversations about once every other month. We, we yeah. I often I am I, you are one of those like few people that I call up Thank when you, I'm DJ. like when everything I everything everything is going fine and then I wake up one day and I look at my book and I'm like oh my god none of this works and then I call you up to to walk through it and you're always like it's fine what's wrong with that yeah <laughs> it's always just your insecurities it's always like something has gotten a grip in your head that has made you doubt a perfectly good idea there's a That's point always the point yeah there's a point when you get so far into something that like if this is if this sucks, I've made so many mistakes to get here that it's unfixable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, I hope I can bluff my way through the rest of this. And you always do. You always do. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So you've had a great launch day. Uh, what else about the book would you like to talk about? Because I am apparently, I, all the stuff I want to talk about, I don't want to spoil the book. Yeah. So um, what what do you what what about this book? How did you feel while writing it compared to writing your other books? What it's was your funny. Experience? I remember writing this book less than I wrote any of my other less than writing any of my other books. So a lot of it is I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory, not the whole backstory, which is my parents were very ill and my husband had health problems as well, and all of that. A lot of that stuff in the book is autobiographical, and a lot of the while I was writing it, I was caring for other people, and that's one thing that has not come up in interviews a lot is this sort of aspect of the book that Lee is like a caregiver for someone who is severely disabled and and, and not really present. And that is such a common experience that I had never read about before. But also while I was writing it, I wrote a lot of it like at my parents' kitchen table in between, you know, making their dinner and making their lunch or whatever. Um, and I just don't remember a lot of it, which is unusual for me. Usually I remember having these nice long writing days and I have no recollection of writing this. I wrote it on airplanes and much like I wrote my first book, mostly commuting on the subway to work. Oh, wow. I kind of wrote this one, you know, commuting back and forth from LA to New York to help, uh, my parents who it turned out were dying didn't know they were dying wouldn't have put all that effort into helping them if i knew they were dying anyway i would have just tossed them a sandwich and moved on, moved on. <laughs> sarah's muted <laughs> there we go don't know why that's it going. wasn't me i didn't do <laughs> I know, yeah. you heard me muted. saying horrible oh, things God. about throwing my parents a sandwich and you're like pull the plug she's saying something really bad now <laughs> Yeah. Um, so did you write it by hand or was that on a laptop the whole time? Laptop. I used to do a lot of my drafts by hand, but I don't anymore. I am almost, I, you know, I write little bits and pieces in a notebook now and then, yeah. but I am mostly fully laptop. When you write your comics, do you just sort of start with notes or do you go right into the format you need for the final? Oh, I have stuff like this. Okay. Say sort of but tell but then I but that's just like my outline kind of for what each chapter is going to be and then I and then I you know actually have to write it sometimes there'll be like suggested dialogue or narration or something I need the notebook I need the notebook for uh like my net if I'm flying without a net I just oh uh, yeah that. 
yeah I need at least to, like sort of a this is the gist of what happens i need to know where i'm where i'm going i i like uh there's those different theories about writing, like you're either an architect or a gardener, and I'm definitely more. What? Of a I never heard that before. What's this? Oh yeah, like an architect is like an, a writer who plans out every chapter, like before they even start writing, they know all the big scenes, they know where they're where they're ending. Whereas a gardener is like, I know what I want this book to basically be, but I'm going to just write it one day at a time, like Pelicanos and Dennis Lehane, like they don't outline, they just kind of keep it in their head. No, I'm um, definitely a gardener. Yeah. Yeah, I'm definitely a gardener. I know I know where what my big goalposts are, but they always kind of move. Before I start a story, yeah. I have the gist of it in my head. And so I write it down. I outline a few chapters and then I'll start writing and and uh, you know, but I, I let myself have enough freedom to get to a point. Because otherwise you just can't surprise yourself. If you can't surprise yourself, you're never gonna surprise anyone else, I feel like. Well, I feel like when you're writing, you should have whatever emotion you want the reader to have. So you should surprise yourself if you want it to be surprising. If it's something sad, you should actually be crying or don't expect anyone else to cry. If you, you know, or make yourself laugh if you're sitting in a coffee shop writing, that's an awkward moment. But if you want other people to laugh, you should laugh. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Our friend Erica, who is here in my apartment helping me since I am an invalid, left a lovely note. Thank you, Erica. <laughs> Um, well, that's interesting. I, yeah, I never thought about it that way. I always, people, always, you know, when you're a writer for X amount of years, you and I have been publishing for about the same amount of time. 20 like something you, years. Yeah. yeah. You meet a lot of people who want advice about writing. And I realized over, especially working in TV, like the last like seven or eight years, you meet a lot of people who, you know, have just kind of come up through the school of TV writing and, and there it's weird for them when they meet somebody who writes like books yep. and stuff, but who also does TV writing. And I just always, I came down to like this one thing recently where I was just like, writing is basically just kind of following your gut. And it's yeah, like, if you, it is. If you don't believe us, if you don't believe a scene, then how are you going to make anyone else believe it? Like if you don't buy whatever thing you're trying to sell, mm -hmm. like, you know, and it's really just about like, how does it feel in your gut? Like, does this feel like a scene is done? Does this feel like this is a good idea for a story? And you just kind of have to, the more you write, the more you kind of learn to trust yourself on it instead of second guessing yourself a ton. Well, that's very much what the Claire DeWitt books are about, or about that process, you know, yeah. that you have to sort of trust yourself to figure out what you're doing in writing in life and anything. And that's also, speaking of TV, the heartbreaking thing often about being in writer's rooms is when you see writers who are gifted if they're yeah. not gifted, you don't fucking care. There's nothing heartbreaking about it. But when you see writers who are good, who are talented, um, but they are, they don't know to do that, to trust yeah. their eyes, mm -hmm. to trust their intuition, that they instead are reaching for scenes they've seen in Star Wars or whatever. And it's like, no, you yeah. can do better. What's your version of this? What is your weird thing that you want to add to this? Well, that's the thing. You can, you can be talented and go into that field and learn a lot about writing. But as long as you're aiming at someone else's target, like when you, if you're not in charge, you're really just trying to please this other person. Yeah, that's what you're getting paid for. Yeah. Yeah. So it be, it's really weird because you end up with a lot of really talented people who ultimately don't trust their own instincts because they're with each job they have to aim at a different target. And it's like, oh, it's it's I, I've been really I was glad that I didn't you know move to Hollywood at 25 and decide to. Oh yeah, me that. too. And that I that I arrived in my forties as somebody who'd written a bunch of stuff and sort of trusted my own instincts as a writer. Um, you know, a lot of it was it was still a huge learning curve to suddenly have to be in a room all day with a bunch of people talking instead of sitting. But the learning curve was about being in the room, not about writing. Yeah, the learning curve was like, how much Xanax do I need to take? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, trying to get trying to get ideas on the board every three minutes is kind of making everyone else not be able to talk. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. I made a rule when I had my writers' room for a pilot I produced last year that did not get picked up. I said. I want everyone to not worry about getting your ideas on the board, worry about getting everyone else's ideas on the board. Ooh. That worked very well. It was a really oh, good wow. way to run the room. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel like people who, people like us who've written more stuff and have also been on the other side there, when we come into those situations, we're always, I, I always just tell all the writers when I'm like running, like the room I was just running 
I was like, I just, I want you guys to all be thinking about what you want to write like after this. And I want you all to feel ownership of the episodes you're writing. Not like you're just trying to like file a, you know, a cog into a piece and then move on. Like I want you all to, but I also want you not to feel like your time is wasted, you know, yeah. a lot of wasted time in that field. And, you know, like, look at, you know, you and David made that beautiful pilot and it didn't get picked up and it's like, holy shit. Yeah. We all you know? made a lot of money though. So you can't say it's time wasted and we made something cool. Yeah. Yeah. But no one else will ever see it, which is heartbreaking. The David yeah. is referring to is David Slade, our dear friend and uh, my friend Erica, who is helping me, her husband, we made a pilot together that did not get picked up with a really incredible cast and, and some really beautiful work from David. Yeah, that's the, I mean, I've written so many pilots that haven't gotten filmed even, so. Oh, me too. Like, that's the only one I've gotten filmed. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's a great white writer's welfare. If you're. Yeah, I know. I can't complain. I make a living writing things that no one sees and that's fine. I make a living. Yeah. <laughs> but you also publish yeah. books. People yeah. can like, see this. Yeah. Yes. 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 Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Is there a bootleg of the pilot? <laughs> I wish, Ken. I keep hoping someone will break our uh, multi-million dollar, you know, uh, uh, backed up contract. You know, those are the penalties if you if you violate those contracts. But there I hope are, someone say will a lot of bad it. things about North Korea and they'll hack and put the. <laughs> oh yeah, good idea. Yeah. <laughs> that's how. That's how. Uh, that's how that. Yeah, the Sony happen. hack happened. I know. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um. All right, so you don't remember writing the book at all. Are we are we done? Are we Actually, done? yeah. If uh, I was gonna wrap wrap okay. us up here, not to interrupt a uh, no, no, no. conversation. We could do this all day as we do back, sometimes. You guys back yeah. weekly for this, you know? <laughs> we will, we will. We do this all the time anyway, so we might as well just tape it and make a career out of it. Yeah, but I do I do want to thank <laughs> both of you uh, for this conversation and partnering with us. And uh, we are so excited about the book of the most precious substance. Uh, it's fantastic. And, you know, I, I, as a bookseller, I could say every book is fantastic, but I really, yeah, really do enjoy this one. It's really great. Uh, and signed copies available at the Mysterious Bookshop, uh, but you can get it anywhere books are sold. Uh, go with an independent bookshop, though. Go course, with an independent please. bookshop, especially the mystery bookshops. Oh, thank say, you. Yes, the mystery yeah, bookshops are so good for writers like me. I mean, yeah. all the independent bookstores are, but the mystery bookshops in particular have a really special place in my heart and have really, frankly, been a huge part of my career. And especially the booksellers like Ryan here at the mystery bookstores hand selling my books has been the the better part of why I am, you know, able to start this business and keep publishing and stuff. So. Oh, Spend yeah. some money with those here, guys. Here. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much, Ed, for doing thank this you. with me. Thank you, Ed. Yes, thank you so much. Well, thanks for having me. And yeah, Bye. we'll uh, hopefully we'll hear from you guys. We'll do something with all of you again sometime soon. So, Anytime. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. Have a yeah good night. We're ready to do this again. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, guys. <laughs> thank you again so thanks. much. Take care. Okay. <laughs>